Pepperwood is a nonprofit organization based on a 3,200 acre nature preserve. And we are located in the Mayacamas Mountains, northeast of Santa Rosa. And we're a place where researchers and community members come together to tackle some of our greatest environmental challenges. Pepperwood's mission is to advance science-based conservation throughout our region and beyond. And our um, preserve serves as a living laboratory and educational campus. We have the Dwight Center facility, which provides our classroom, lab, gallery, and office spaces. And we strive towards our mission through our three critical program areas. So we have research, education, and community. We conduct research on climate, water, plants, wildlife, and we use that information to better inform decisions about how we can care for our environment. And education, we have programs like this one for our wider community um, and for learners of all ages, from children's to, children to teens, um, college students, adult learners, K through gray, as we like to say. <laughs> and community, um, our volunteers contribute directly to our mission um, through active community science projects on the preserve and stewardship um, and volunteer days. And we're very grateful for the support of our members and our donors. And just real quickly, a little background on Pepperwood. It was once a ranch owned by Kenneth Bechtel, and he donated, donated it to the California Academy of Sciences in 1978 when he passed away. And the Academy operated the property as a field station for many years. Um, and then they sold it when they were re renovating their museum in San Francisco. And at that time, Herb and Jane Dwight created the Pepperwood Foundation to acquire the property in 2005 and get us started. And the Dwight Center for Conservation Science was constructed in 2010. And ever since then, we have hosted over 25,000 visitors from scientists to students, to families, to researchers. And we hope that you can join us there someday in the future as well, instead of online, um, to experience the preserve. It's uh, home to an incredible diversity of plants and animals. And um, yeah, we hope to see you there in person someday. And this brings us to Autumn Summers, our instructor today. Um, so I'll give you a brief bio on Autumn and then pass it over to her. So from her first herb class over 25 years ago, Autumn has been exploring the many facets of herbalism. She's an avid gardener and wild foods forager and teaches how to grow your own, own herbs and how to safely and sustainably gather and use abundant edible and medicinal plants, seaweeds and mushrooms in Northern California at the California School of Herbal Studies. She's passionate about sharing this empowering knowledge with others in a responsible and interactive way. And that, with that, I will pass it over to Autumn. All right, thank you, Holland, and hi, everyone. We have a nice cozy class tonight, which is great. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Let me get the right thing up. And um, great, you should all should be seeing immunity boosting, elderberry. Great. Um, yeah, we'll keep it conversational. I know everyone's got a lot going on, and um, so trusting. I mean, obviously, I can see you're all safe inside somewhere, and hopefully, you, the air was better where you are. It was better for me in Sebastopol today, and I, I know the. The firefighters are getting a handle on the fires, so we had a lot of evacuations released today. So um, lots of good news on that front. Um, yeah, I teach um, primarily at the, Cal at the California School of Herbal Studies, but I love doing classes here for Pepperwood. Always honored to um, be able to join in with Pepperwood because um, they, they all do such great things, Holland, so please pass that on to everybody. Um, so we'll just get started and we'll see, um, we may not take a full hour and a half, but we might. It all depends on questions and Q&A. I haven't done this exact configuration of slides. It's been fun to add to my elderberry slides. And as uh, Holland was saying, I have been studying and using plants for uh, many, many years. It's, it's just my um, passion, one of the passions I have in my life. And um, so we're gonna have fun talking a lot about elder and also let's see let me make sure my chat's open i think i lost that feature when i opened this up 
So I may have to have you do it, Holland. Let's see. Just give me a sec, see if I can. Oh, no, I can't seem to pull that up with this configuration. Um, and there we go. There we go. There it is. Participants and chat. Great. When I pulled up my screens, the chat went away. Thanks for your patience. There's a little technical glitches here. Okay, let's let's keep rolling. So um, first off, I wanted to acknowledge the First Peoples of Sonoma County and um, in particular, the well, all of them, the Pomo, Wapo, and Miwok, um, and Pepperwood is on Wapo territory. And this is a picture of um, the Native American Advisory Council. I don't know if this is everyone, but it is the picture from the Pepperwood um, website. So Clint and Lucy McKay and Christy um, Gobbledon and Brenda Flies with Hawks. So um, really important to have the input and um, guidance of the Native community. And also just to acknowledge, especially since we're talking about elder, that this is a plant traditionally used here, grows native here, as well as it's an interesting plant because um, the genus is all around the temperate parts of the world. And so there's rich, rich lore, which I we're not going to get into in any kind of depth tonight, from Europe with elder um, as well, that species over there. And then um, I don't even know about um, all the uses from the from China and Korea. I know there that it's also used there different species. So, um, but we are in this territory and um, want to acknowledge that. Um, I also want to acknowledge because we are, you know, when you're harvesting elder, unless you're doing it on property where you've actually planted your wild crafting. And so if you haven't read Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, um, she's a Native American woman and scientist. Um, and from the East Coast, and it's a beautiful book, but one of the chapters is called The Honorable Harvest. And so I like to bring this up. Um, and she talks about how it's a practice both ancient and urgent um, and applies to every exchange between people and the earth. And its protocol is not written down, but if it were, it would look something like this. Um, so ask permission of the ones whose lives you seek. And you know, with elder, we're taking berries, but we're still taking a part of the plant. Um, abide by the answer. I think that can be challenging for some of us and, you know, the answer can come, you know, depends if it's just asking with your intention and um, sometimes you just sense like, nope, this isn't right. Um, and other times it's a yes. Um, and also no, don't take the first plants you see and don't take the last. The first ones just make sure it gives you a sense like, oh, here's this plant, but let's see what else is going on here. Like get a, get a, a bigger view of what's happening. Harvest in a way that minimizes harm. I think we all, I mean, most of these seem very obvious, but it's always good to say them. Um, take only what we need and leave some for others. And I know um, Holland and I were talking um, before we all got online about how she found some, I don't know, Holland, you may want to chime in, but I'll say what you were sharing with me. Found some elderberries, but it looked like that tree didn't have that many. So she just took a few thinking of like the birds and the other beings and um, animals that may be eating them and needing them. Um, use everything you take. And you know, we've all had the, that, I've had that experience where it's like, oh, I didn't actually uh, read it all or use it all, but at least I'm giving it back to the earth or, you know, something like have that intention. I do my best to do that. Um, um, take only that which is given to you, share it as the earth has shared with you. Be grateful. I think that's actually usually where I start too, is, but you do have to ask permission and then reciprocate in some way. You know, maybe it's watering the plant or just singing a song or whatever that feels, but there's, there's um, just a lot we can think about when we're harvesting plants. But there is a whole relationship to doing that. And I think that that's um, really important that we have that interaction. Um, that we don't, um, that we remember that we are part of nature and this is one way we are, can engage in that way. Okay, just, there we go. Before we get into elder though, I wanted to point out a couple of plants that um, are happening and this are in flower right now and could be very useful with the fires and the stress. And this is one, it's a non-native um, pink mimosa or silk tree. It's called Albizia julibrisson. 
and it's blooming right now and it's used as an ornamental but these flowers and also the bark can be made into tea or um, alcohol extracts and they're really good for anxiety and depression and so um, and when i says there calms disturbed shen tcm is traditional chinese medicine and um, shen is like our heart energy when our heart's upset um, and so it's really lifting up that which i think we could all relate to right now um, with everything going on and one of the translations um, of it from the chinese name is collective happiness bark or the tree of happiness and it also can be specific for tree grief and trauma both physical and um, emotional so really it's kind of at its tail end of blooming right now you probably have many in your neighborhood if you live in a neighborhood there's a bunch around my uh, my area and i and they smell divine so i highly recommend you play around with them and you, like i said you can make tea you can put them fill up a jar and cover it with vodka and make a, a tincture and um and then you'll have an extract um to use later on or you can dry them they dry down to pretty much nothing so it's kind of nice to use them fresh or, or preserve them in some way. And then just for soothing, you know, the smoke's starting to go away, but we have our wild mallows. So they have this kind of umbrella shaped leaf there, you know, unless they're in a garden, they have some in my garden right now. They're more of a spring plant. They're also called cheese weeds and they have these little um, pink flowers. And they're very mucilaginous. So what that means is it's coating and soothing the mucous membranes, which is really good when we have smoke going on because um, that's one of the first things to do is to have teas that are soothing. So this is a nice one that you can make a tea out of. Um, and it's related to the herb called marshmallow, but these also have that, you know, kind of like okra, which, you know, we don't use a lot of things in our diet in the U.S., um, at least most of us that are, have that kind of mucilaginous, um, like an aloe vera quality, but that can be really soothing. Um, and if you can't find this, you know, there's some really great teas out there, anything with licorice or marshmallow. There's a number of, of brands, Traditional Medicinals, our local company makes a really great throat coat tea, but something like that. So this can be part of it and um, just good with all that soothing, with all that dryness from the smoke and irritation that we can get. Um, okay. So enough about that, but just to, you know, those are important things to know about. Um, so elder, so here's some elderberries. Let's uh, get into it. So there's a number of elder species and um, these are the main ones. Um, well, they're the ones I'm familiar with. I don't know the ones in Asia, um, but that doesn't apply really to us. These are the ones that apply to us. So um, there's really, you probably heard a lot about black elderberry, but ours is really a blue elderberry. Um, but the black and blue ones are the ones that are primarily used for food and medicine. Um, the black um, Sambucus nigra is native to Europe. And like I said, there's just a long history of, of use. Um, there's stories, the pages and pages of stories that I found. And part of it is like the elder trees are the center of the, the garden. Um, there's a lot of things about sitting under an elder in European traditions from various countries of, and on certain nights and you'll see the fairies come through or that it's a, a portal into the fairy world. It's also a guardian and it also can be um, kind of taciturn, kind of um, trying to think of the Indian goddess that's like the goddess of creation and destruction. It has, there's this like um, also to beware of the elder. Um, uh, there's a lot of traditions of like people not wanting to cut it and burn it um, with other things. So it's um, it's a powerful plant and respected um, wherever it grows. Um, the name elder actually isn't from it like being an elder of the of the garden that we use that term. It's more a derivation from a word for fire because the stalks. The stems have a pith in them that you can easily hollow out and use for fire to like blow, you know, if you have a fire going, you can blow through a hollow tube to get it going. And that is actually um, where it's thought that the derivation of the name comes from. And Sambucus actually relates to a musical instrument, an ancient mus musical instrument. And it's interesting because it is used to make flutes. I'll show you some pictures and other musical instruments. Um, so there's the black elderberry when you buy preparations. 
um, tinctures or things like that go to the grocery store. Those are going to be made out of by yeah, they're all going to be made out of Sambucus nigra. Um, and then we have, I'm going to go to this, to our other blue. So you'll notice our, our um, this one, the blue elderberry from the West Coast of the United States in the West, basically West of the Rockies, um, has a bluish cast. And it used to actually be classified as Sambucus mexicana or sometimes Sambucus cerulea. And then recently um, with DNA testing, they realized the taxonomists that um, our blue and black, because there's also one on the East Coast species, are actually sub Sambucus nigra and they're subspecies. So it's a species complex. So it's very, they are very closely, these are closely related. Um, it's just that this has this bluish cast. We'll look at that more on the next slide. Um, one thing I want you to notice that these beautiful creamy flowers, they're kind of in a flat topped cluster or slightly domed where the, when we look at the red elders, so they have really red berries, so they're super easy to tell then, but when they're flowering, these are in definitely a cone shape. Um, and in general, we don't use these. I have never used them for medicinal uses. You do hear accounts of using the berries for food. Um, I just came across one account of one herbalist who's used the red in some similar ways to the blue, but it is not, that's the only account I've heard of a Western herbalist doing that. Um, they contain more of what are called the cyanogenic glycosides, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, one thing you'll notice though in identifying elder, it's a deciduous tree, so it loses all of its leaves. Um, and notice this is one leaf here, and this is one leaf here. So they, these are opposite leaves, and then the leaves themselves have leaflets. So they're what's called opposite compound leaves. And there's not a lot of trees or shrubs we have around here that are like that. Um, when they're fruiting, they're obvious to tell, really obvious. Um, here's a nice, so here's the blue. Um, so they can be kind of shrubby like this. This actually, uh, I realized I didn't get a good picture showing, um, they're, they usually don't have a single trunk unless they're really old. I've seen a few like that, but usually they have multi trunks. They're, they're really kind of between a shrub and a tree unless they're a really tall one. Um, and those branches can break off. They go everywhere from near the coast to up in the Sierra Nevada. I've seen the blue elderberry. Um, and actually, I'm going to go back for a minute. The red elderberry, this is usually at the coast or more up at the higher elevations where the blue elderberry is much more widespread throughout California. So they do have, um, they can overlap some. I've actually seen a blue and a red growing right next to one another at Point Reyes when they were just right on their, their edge of their habitat. That was cool. Um, so here we have um, our local blue and it does have this little coating on the berries that's actually why it's called blue elderberry because it's not completely black colored though and that just comes off it's just like on grapes how you know you can just wipe it off um and it's that's what the species does and you really want it to be really blue um you can see there's actually a few little green berries down here like if, if i was harvesting this cluster like these ones up here a little bit greenish um, like I did the other day, I harvested kind of at dusk, so I, most of the ones I harvested were really blue, and then when I got home I realized, oh, it's got some green on it, so I left those clusters out and they have ripened up more. You're really aiming for like that blue color. The flowers are also used, we'll talk a little bit about that, in fact, when I learned about elderberry um, 25 plus years ago, um, that's what people talked about and actually the whole thing about using elderberries instead of the flowers is a, that becoming so popular is quite recent. I mean definitely in the last 15 years. I mean literally we did not talk, did not talk about the elderberries being used when I was first trained. Um, so the flowers have kind of gotten out of favor in some ways but they are very, if you look in a lot of the older herbals you're going to find as least, usually more information on the flowers and the berries. Berries for food more and the flowers more for medicinal use. So now we can blend them because we've learned more about the berries, but I, I find that really fascinating um, that that's what's going on with it. These things change as, as uh, uh, fashion changes and, and how we use things. Here's a writer from the 1600s. Um, 
You talked about if the medicinal properties of elders' leaves, barks, and berries, see here he's not even talking about flowers, were, were fully known. I cannot tell what our countrymen would ail for, which he might not fetch a remedy for from every hedge, either for sickness or wounds. Um, and so it's also been called like the comfort of the, um, the country folk, the medicine chest of the country folk in Europe and especially in England. Um, and yeah, the leaves used a lot for salve. Um, the bark's even having some specific uses where we don't use those as much now, though some people are starting to use the leaves again um, or bringing that back more. I'm sure there's always been people that have used those, but um, I love that quote because it really just speaks to how well known elder um, has been over the ages. So here's some traditional uses of um, Native American uses of elder um, that are documented. Of course, there are many more. Um, so this was a, a fairly quick search, but um, uh, here's, um, these are musical instruments. So flutes all throughout the Kumeyaay or down in Southern California tribe and the Miwok, of course, I think believe this was a Sierra Miwok. It didn't actually clarify. So it could also be Coast Miwok. Um, so these are the stocks and um, this is a, um, a percussive instrument. And you can go online and see, find videos of these being used in, for traditional songs. So they can be really well decorated or here's a more, you know, undecorated but very um, practical and useful clapper stick and it's hit against the, like it's held and then hit against the other hand to make that percussive sound. Um, and then the flutes, these are traditional California style flutes. And I did take a class with the gentleman, Ben Cunningham, um, who, I believe he's Pitt River um, as one of his tribe and, and Miwok, but I could be wrong on that. But anyway, he's a master flutist and he, we all made flutes. He could play every one of them beautifully. It was a class at Point Reyes many years ago. We could get like a little tiny toot out of it, but he was like picked each one of them up and it's like, I still, I, and I have not been able to get a sound out of that flute in the last, in many years, but I'm gonna keep trying. Um, but here's some of the uses. So we have decoction. That's when you cook a leaf for a while in water. So used for new colds. Now, I don't know exactly how that was used. Was it used as a steam or just something? You know, the leaves can be very strong and a lot of references really say don't eat the leaves or use them. They often have a use as a purgative or an emetic um, to really purge. But we have, you know, definitely fruits eaten as food and then the fire making and also arrow shafts. Um, Infusion of flowers, so we have traditional use of the flowers. Um, we have mash berries mixed with manzanita flour. So this is manzanita berry flour um, and then stored with dry cakes, which the manzanita brings a sweetness and a sourness. Um, and then Cherokee, the leaves used to wash sores to prevent infection. And infusion of berry used for rheumatism. That one is interesting too to me because there's a story in one of the herbal books, a modern herbal about um, it was in Kent, it was in England, they had grapes and they were making, or they were making a port, but it was being cut with elderberry. And, um, but people liked it. And actually when they were drinking it, their rheumatism, their achy joints went away. And when they found, when the, when the uh, officials found out, they're like, no, you know, this port has to be made just with this. And when they took the elderberry out, these medicinal properties went away. Um, so that was an inadvertent uh, understanding of some of the uses of elderberry. Probably added a nice flavor. Um, this is also, I wanted to bring back, I mean, um, of course, we've just experienced fires and, um, and many, as I'm sure, I imagine you all know that, um, you know, many of our Native American, Native California plants and plants throughout the West are really fire adapted and elder is definitely fire adapted. It will sprout up unless it's been really, really scorched, but I've seen areas that have been really scorched and elder will just stump sprout right up. Um, so it's actually incredibly fire adapted. I don't know if the seeds do that in fire. I, I don't think so, but I don't know. I know manzanita needs fire or going through that an animal to sprout. So um, in areas this, with these burns, if there's elder, we will see them actually come back pretty strongly. That's been my experience with them. 
Um, this is a friend of mine, um, Tamara Wilder with Paleotechnics, and she um, makes these containers out of the elder stock. So you can cut them and hollow them out and then put a cork, just keep the bottom, keep some of that pith in the bottom, and then you have a, a container for magic potions or passing notes or um, seeds or, you know, anything that you want, actually. Um, so that's, they're pretty fun to make actually. And then she also makes these little drum ornaments with the uh, elderberry in the center there and some um, leather around it. So just some other uses for elder. Um, so current uses, um, flowers. So that's of course in the spring. And of course you wouldn't wanna, you'd never wanna harvest all the flowers because then you don't get berries, but they smell divine. They're very fragrant. And we do even have, what is it, St. Germain that liqueur that's made with elder um, from Europe. Um, but traditionally the flowers, the hot tea for colds and flu, fever, catarrh is like, you know, inflammation, um, um, mucus, uh, congestion of the upper respiratory tract. Um, cough it can be used for. And then you see it used for complexion and teas for the skin and that type of a thing as well. These are just some, some very general uses here. But the way I think about it really is those flowers, they bring up a fever, they help with fever and flu, they help with the mucous membranes being healthy. Um, so, and I've actually had a, a colleague of mine, um, Brian Bowen at the California School, He's like, he likes the flowers and you'll see this reference for like hay fever um, because of that congestion and um, also helping control that. So. Yeah, when you have a chance to smell the flowers in the spring, they they are divine. And actually in the Sierra, I was just up, let's see, I guess it was, we are maybe at 6,000 feet, um, and there was elder, they were still blooming, um, and the berries were just starting to come on. And every once in a while, you'll have a plant that has flowers, the last of the flowers, and the first of the berries. Um, at the same time, on the same plant, it can be, they, they have an interesting range that way. Um, so the leaves, um, one, one reference, and actually the, I don't know the exact reference, but saying gather the last day of April, so that's one person's reference, but internally as a purgative tea, not something I would recommend, but more, you know, something to look at as a poultice, which is an external, like you mash up the, the leaf, like if you do plantain or comfrey, you mash up the leaf with some water and then lay it on the area that needs healing. So bruises, sprains, and inf and possibly infection. Um, I haven't actually used the leaves this way. This is some way I want to uh, experiment with more. Um, and then the berries, general immune support. They're really, you know, they're dark berries. They're beautiful. So like, just like blueberries and, you know, we know how healthy those are. Whenever you have those dark berries, um, they're going to be rich in bioflavonoids that are really great for blood vessel strength. Um, Oh, it looks like I have a little typo there with an and. Um, yeah, made into cordials, syrups, tinctures, or glycerites. Um, and we'll talk about more of that. Um, I have a couple of references from Donnie Yancey. He had a nice write-up. There's many herbalists that do, um, but I liked just this particular quote from him. He's up in Ashland, Oregon. Um, general nutritive tonic. We don't usually think of it that way, but the berries being nutritive. Um, Immune tonic, so really the research on it um, with the berries uh, that came out of Israel was about it really reducing, um, especially influenza A and B, and actually helping stop those viruses from reproducing. And so it's gonna be more effective usually if you take it right at the beginning of something. Though you can, some people also use it like, oh, I might've been exposed and I wanna, take a tonic. You certainly, there's nothing wrong with that, and it has a long tradition is for food. So it's really a plant that, you know, especially the berries, that's like food to medicine, and there's, it really blends in together. Very great for kids. Um, I haven't used it for muscle pain, but that's interesting. Um, and then the red berried species really, as I mentioned before, are not used medicinally that I've found any references to. So elder has these cyanogenic glycosides, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, and here it is, a nice picture from the Jepson manual, just really showing those what are called pinnately compound leaves and that they're opposite. 
Um, the other thing I don't have a picture of, I realize, is that the stems, especially the like a few years old, they have little bumps on them. They're pretty distinctive. Um, and if you go to plantid.net, that's a really great local resource for plant ID. And they've got lots of great pictures and they've got some nice ones of the bark. And then the old bark is very different looking. Um, you don't often see a lot of them get that old around here. At least I haven't, but um, they're around. They're really pretty. Okay. So I think, I wonder if I should stop and see if there's any questions. How's everybody doing? Thumbs up. This is good, what you're hoping for? Okay. I mean, elder is just an amazing plant. And uh, you can definitely buy them at the nurseries. Our native plant nurseries have our native um, species. And then there's also the black, just the straight up black elderberry. Um, there are cultivars that are, um, some of them are pink actually. There's a pink flowered and like lacy leaf that looks, doesn't really even, you're like, wow, that's an elder. So that's been selected. So under Sambucus nigra, there are some cultivars for people to grow that some are very ornamental, um, but you can choose that or our native one would be fine. I like to go with the native ones just because I'm trying to grow more of those in my garden, but um, you know, choose what you can. But they do get, you know, 15 to 20 feet tall and need some space. So you need a good spot for it if you're going to do it. At the California School of Herbal Studies, we had some uh, seasonal creek that was right below where our parking lot was, a little parking area, and we had some space between that. And it's like, oh, there's a good place for elder because there's space. It's not going to hurt it, you know, hurt anything. And we sometimes have to prune it because it drops. They drop they can drop down when they're full of berries. The limbs can get heavy, but that's okay. We just harvest them. So um, just to mention again, the dried flower is used so much. We've mentioned that. Herbalist Jim McDonald, so um, there are some references and um, Holland can send you a copy of this um, PowerPoint. Um, Jim McDonald is a great herbalist in the Midwest or upper Midwest who um, has a lot to say about a lot of plants and I really like his approach and he's really into the flowers. He's really into that more traditional use. Um, I love this, a gentle but virtuous relaxant diaphoretic. So a diaphoretic is a term that really helps us sweat and so you know when you get a fever or a cold, a fever, it's like if you have, it's your body wanting to get rid of something. It's a heating up is a way to kill off the viruses and the, and the um, bacteria. And so a diaphoretic helps that process of opening the pores, but also relaxing because you know sometimes you can get that tenseness and also the body aches with those types of fevers sometimes. So also to help move mucus and phlegm out of there and um, stuffy sinus or lung congestion. And this is just a piece of a much longer post. I will say the one thing in Jim's post, and I've meant to write him, is he mentioned, he talks about these flower clusters being an umbel, and technically they aren't, and it's a common thing. Umbels are like um, wild carrot, where every, or angelica, where every flower comes down to one specific point, one central point, and even though it looks like that on elder initially, if you look underneath it, that's not what's going on. So, um, just a little technical thing there. Um, but other than that, I love what Jim has to say about everything. Um, and then Donnie just, you know, talks about some of the, what the berries are rich in, vitamin C and other flavonoids, as we've mentioned, but also different vitamins and trace elements. Um, so, you know, they're a berry, just like we know, a lot of berries are really great. The thing with this berry though is some people have been, and Jim actually did a great post, he has a great Facebook um, page and he asked the question just, gosh, two weeks ago, hey, um, who out there has gotten sick? Who's, what's been your experience with elderberry? And it was really great to read because he's got a lot of followers and people are like, I've been fine, I've never had issues with it. And people are like, oh, I uh, put the berries in my granola and yogurt and I was sick and throwing up for a day. So this thing about like, oh, let's eat the berries, you know, when they're dried, like they're like dried raisins <laughs> or dried blueberries. They're not. You don't want to eat them. Um, you don't want to eat a bunch of seeds of these. You can taste a berry when they're fresh. They don't really taste that great fresh, honestly. Um, so you want to dry them or cook them, but they're even dried. They're not meant to be made into uh, um, 
used as a dried fruit by themselves. You want to process them again. So hopefully that makes sense. Some people, there are some people who can eat a bunch of them raw and do that. But um, so here's the question. Are they toxic and do they cause a cytokine storm? I don't know if you've heard that, but there's been a whole rumor about it. So um, the leaves, bark, and roots of elderberry, the whole plant contains a cyanogenic glycoside called sambunigrin. Um, and these can make people nauseous. Um, and it's mostly the seeds. And also the leaves have more of that in them. Um, that's why they have that purgative property. Um, and so drying and definitely cooking um, the seeds or the berry, the fruit, makes them safe because that evaporates out. So here's from Jim McDonald, you know, in his post, just saying that some people are really sensitive to uncooked elderberry. And he has actually seen even people every once in a while. I have seen this. I've taken elder a lot. I've talked to a lot of people who've taken tinctures, which is an alcohol extract. Um, and I've never heard of anybody having these issues. But in his Facebook asking, you know, a few thousand people, there were definitely some people who were like, yeah, I can't do it when it's dried and in an extract. Definitely don't add it to smoothies. Just um, extract it in alcohol or make the syrups or the other things that we're going to talk about. Um, the other thing that came up with when COVID started um, uh, was that elderberries can cause a cytokine storm or cytokine. Yeah, and we've all learned about that with COVID and everything's like, who is that was not in our, vocab our regular vocabulary until this year. Um, and it's a really interesting story, and this is according to Donnie, but also this is exactly what I found, is the person who said that, who's an herbalist, read a study, and basically took out a piece of information that it's not what the conclusion of the study was, um, but it was just one tiny piece of it that, and extrapolated from there that elderberry could do this. There's never been any evidence of it. Nobody's ever seen it. And that actually the study, showed that taking elderberry actually helped you in a flu and, and virus situation. Now, there's no evidence yet that um, elderberry is specific to helping with coronavirus, coronaviruses. Um, we don't know, but it doesn't, there's other things. Plants are, you know, working on, there's so many constituents, right? We just named a few of them. Um, so it's certainly helping support the immune system. And so there is, it will not cause a cytokine storm. There's, that, that just doesn't work that way. And this is part of the issue we get into um, with the studies that like look at one constituent of a plant and then extrapolate from there when it's like, wow, it's a whole plant and how is it taken? It's different than pharmaceuticals, but um, we do see that from time to time. So hopefully that helps clarify it. And you can certainly, Donnie, I looked for a lot of good write-ups about this and I did find that Donnie's, I thought was one of the best on it. Um, okay, so, um, oh, you haven't heard the term. Okay, yeah, the term is really the people who have COVID. It's basically when your immune system, it's, it's um, you get sick and then your immune system is very activated and it's when it gives into that overdrive like we hear people with COVID and we, it's not just with COVID, it's like the immune system can do that. And then the, it basically starts attacking itself because it's such a full blown response to um, the virus or bacteria or what, it, what the body's fighting. So um, that's when we get these very serious, serious cases. So, um, so I'm glad you haven't heard about it. Now you have, in case you hear about it or somebody goes, Elderberry, I heard this thing, <laughs> this rumor. So, um, so here they are. Here's these beautiful elderberries that are ripe right now. Um, and um, yeah, they're ripe in August or September, depending on the year uh, here in the Bay Area. Um, we definitely, as I mentioned, want to get them when they look like this. And you can see how when that co coating rubs off, they're quite black. So you can see how they're actually like the Sambucus nigra. Um, so you want to remove them from the stems. And there's, you know, there's tiny little stems there. And um, this is actually from Elise, on, which, which I'll mention on the next page. I mean, she, that's a great job. So when I first did this, I was like, oh my gosh, it's so tedious. But then somebody said, freeze them. So if you just do a quick freeze, just to get them frozen, 
they'll actually break off and you pull them out of the freezer and process them right away to get them off the stems. They come off the stems very easily. Um, I did also see a picture of somebody using kind of a wide tooth comb to help comb them off. I've never done that, but that looked interesting. Um, and then at this point, once you've gotten them off the stem, you can use them fresh to make a syrup. I've known people who have juiced them as well, um, though I haven't done that. Um, you definitely want to get rid of the seeds, but we'll talk about that process when you're using them in a fresh form. The trees can be pretty tall. So this is just an example of like somebody having a hook to, you know, creating a, a quick hook to be able to bend the branches down to get to the clusters. And when you're harvesting, you know, they'll be in these clusters and then this stem will go back and you just want to cut that stem where it attaches to the tree. Um, yeah, there's lots, there are thousands of recipes online of making, you know, traditionally into wines or jams. We'll talk about um, the syrup. Oh yeah, use a fork. Great. Yeah, a fork would work too. <laughs> yeah, tall husband, that really helps. Um, and then, you know, we can't get them all, which is good. It leaves some for the, for the plant and the, the, the birds and the, the other critters. Okay. Um, so here's a great elderberry syrup. This is from um, a friend, uh, a, a colleague, Elise Crone, who's up in, um, last time I talked to her, she was up in Washington and working with, um, and now I'm forgetting the tribe that she was working with, but there's such a revitalization of food. She was helping with that food recipes. So um, this is basically how I've made it too. I just thought, oh, wow, this is a great recipe. I don't need to rewrite out, rewrite it out. So um, yeah, you want to get the berries um, like we did. So they're going to be at this stage. And then you put them in um, a, a pan with some water, a saucepan, um, about a quarter cup per quart of berries. And then you heat them until the juice starts coming up and you mash them like with a spoon or a potato masher as they're cooking. You want to boil. I've actually boiled it. You'll find recipes or got not, not a hard boil, but brought it up to a slight simmer. Um, but you want to basically get the berries disengaged from the juice, you know, um, which once they heat up and cook, that will release. And then here she is. This is a muslin cloth. So cheesecloth you could use, just something um, over a strainer once you've heated it up. And then to strain that juice out. And then at this point, you need to preserve it. So when you're making a syrup, um, to really preserve, um, you need to have at least a cup of sweetener per cup of juice. And even um, uh, this one, I mean, if you're using, so it's a lot, it's a lot of sweetener if you're just going for a straight syrup. Um, so you add that in, it could be honey, it can be glycerin is vegetable glycerin, um, which is used to extract, it has a sweetness to it, um, or sugar. And then you pour it into a glass jar with a lid. I mean, you could can it, I believe. I haven't done that, but I have seen people do that. And then store it in the fridge, in the refrigerator. Um, and of course, if it gets moldy, then it's spoiled. I mean, you could try putting it in the freezer. Um, the other thing you can do is also add some brandy to it at this stage or some alcohol, which will help it preserve. So that's... Um, another option if you um, want to keep it more preserved. But that's a basic syrup. And so at this point you can, and you, you know, this, a lot of people add um, cinnamon to this. Some people add a little lemon. You'll find a lot of recipes, but that's the basic idea. Um, sometimes you see like echinacea and elder combined, but usually you're making the elder separate and then you can combine it with other things. So you could make an elderberry syrup. Um, and then if you have like an echinacea extract, you could combine those. You want to have at least 25% alcohol to preserve it from that level. But, you know, you can get creative once you've made your syrup, um, if you want to make it that way and make it sweet. Let's see, Adele. Um, when making a syrup like this, is there something that, yeah, you would definitely, you could take it on a daily basis or you can, and I think I have a dosage, I'm sure I have a dosage on the next slide. So let's go to that. So something that I've done more of is more of a, what would be called a cordial, which is basically an alcohol extract that has a sweetener to it. So I've used dried elderberries in this case. Um, but you could use the syrup actually. I mean, this is different because you're using dried elderberries, putting them in a jar, 
adding the brandy um, and then adding some honey. Now you might not want that much that much honey. It's really to your taste. So you can really play around with it. Of course, the more honey, the more sweet it's going to be. And then you could add something, usually like I'll add a cinnamon stick, maybe a little bit of ginger. Um, if I have echinacea, I might throw a little bit in there. Or just, like I said, add the, add the combine it with an echinacea um, later on, a separate echinacea. Because echinacea is a great immune modulator as well. They're, they combine nicely, I think. Um, I'm personally a big fan of echinacea. Um, so you put these in a pint jar and, um, or, you know, a jar that fits them. Label, always label everything. Um, let it sit for at least two weeks and then shake it every day. So, and then you strain it and then store it. So at that point, um, it's going to preserve because of the alcohol in there. Um, and then here's a, a general dose, one half to one teaspoon every two to three hours, the first sign of illness. I mean, I, I have a heavier doser. I would probably, yeah, every two to three hours, I guess that seems accurate. There's times where I feel like the other day I had this strange experience where it's like my throat, it seemed kind of sore, but it's like, it wasn't actually sore. And then I realized, wow, my glands are really swollen. And of course I was like, gosh, did I get exposed to COVID and I couldn't, I mean, I've been going to the grocery store, but I just didn't have any other signs. So, I, and it was before the, the smoke and I had actually echinacea with me. If I had had elder, I would have used it too, but I just did very high doses and then went to bed early and it was like, I'm going to feel better in the morning. And sure enough, it went way down. So, um, so usually it's like trying to catch those first signs of something. That was a really obvious sign um but uh sometimes it's really subtle sometimes it's just like oh like you're cranky or you have a slight headache or you're just a little tired you know it's not really obvious if you can catch something at that point herbs you're going to find that the herbs work really well um and then general preventative dose you know one half to one and a half teaspoons every day so that would go with the syrup as well. The syrup is great like on pancakes if you you know or ice cream or things like that too. I mean it's a flavoring. Once it's cooked or sweetened, elder has a really beautiful flavor to it. There's traditions you know for pies like I said, for jams and even elderberry wine. In fact, um, uh, I know somebody up in Oregon, she um, got a USDA grant for like women owned agricultural businesses. And she's got a company called Wild Wines and she makes like elderberry wines and rose hips and hawthorns. So, um, you know, that's more involved of course, but you can certainly get into that if you want to. Um, okay, I think that's it on elder. Let me see if there's any other questions and if anybody wants to unmute as well. Oops, and let's see, you don't need to see. That notice. What was that about howling? I just have seen your picture. So um, have you all used, it sounds like Sonia, you've used elder before. Yeah. So, okay. I'm actually experimenting with it right now and I'm cooking up a jar of in vodka. I'm making elderberry vodka right now. Oh, elderberry vodka. Okay. Yes. I've never done it before and it's quite an experience. So um, what I got here is, it's really dark in here, so I don't know if you can see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you there it is. You can see. That's great. So I got like half a jar, it's a pint jar of uh, elderberries, and they were frozen for a while, and now um, I put them in like, I fill it up with vodka, so now I'm waiting to see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, and that's actually, vodka is a great way to preserve different fruits and to get bring that fruity flavor. I mean, there's a, yeah, there's a lot you can do with that. So this is, you know, you can go online and you will see cordial, lots of cordial recipes, especially from the UK and Europe is where I saw most of those. Um, but there is no shortage of elderberry recipes out there. Oh, right, store-bought syrups. Yeah, so you can really control like, oh, do I want to use... A good honey. Do I want to, am I okay, you know, if you're using it for yourself, are you okay with some alcohol in it? Because then you won't have to use as much sweetener. Um, 
You could do uh, elderberry um, glycerite. Some people prefer to do that and not use alcohol. Um, so there's definitely some options there, but it's basically that same idea of covering up the elderberries. And in this case, they were dried. So let's say you don't have access to fresh elderberries. Um, you can buy dried elderberries from like Rosemary's Garden. I think they still have them. I haven't actually checked. There's been, with COVID in March, elderberries, like the the raw material sold out. And so people are waiting for the next um, crop, which is happening, excuse me, happening now. Um, but that's, that was the experience. I also work for an herbal company and um, everybody just sold out of many products and especially elderberry, huge run on elderberry. Um, but another company, uh, Mountain Rose Herbs is online. They, I haven't checked, but they may have elderberries if you can't find, uh, if you don't have fresh. Um, yeah, yeah, the cordial recipe is fun and you can play around like with, this, with the spices and things that you wanna put in there. Um, so that's, that's a fun thing to do. So one question I have about the cordial, you're using two and a half ounces of dried. How, that, how, how would that relate to fresh weight wise? Um, you know, I've only done this recipe with dried, but usually plants are gonna dry down, gosh. Right, so would you say? I would say like 20%. I mean, this could equal like 10 ounces or of uh, fresh berries. And then if you're using fresh, then it gets a little trickier. Then I would use more vodka because brand, you know, or even a higher strength alcohol because you're going to pull the water um, from the berries into your extract. Um, I see. You might even want to let them wilt a little bit. That's not a bad thing to do to let them wilt a little bit and get some of that water off. I hope that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. right. And then, um, yeah, the other thing here is let's look at, so we talked about in the in it, um, description about fire cider. Oh yeah, where might one find elderberries growing wild in Sonoma County? Um, you know, we see them mostly here around like the Russian River is where I've seen the most, kind of along the, um, or creeks. They like to be not right in the water, but kind of in that, what's called the riparian zone. Um, I'm trying to think of other places. Sometimes you do see them on dry hillsides and everything. I can't think of places that are easily accessible. Here's what's tricky about Sonoma County in particular is, you know, we don't have forest land or really BLM land, um, Bureau of Land Management. And so um, we don't have a lot of places where you can actually, where, which, where it's easy to harvest unless it's like somebody's private land. And I will say that that's where you find elderberries primarily around here is along the, the major streams and um, rivers. Yeah, just right on the, on the banks. Um, yeah, good question. Um, and you can go to Cal, there's a really good website if you haven't played around with it called Cal Flora that shows places, um, it just shows like where elder grows in general and it shows documented places where it's been found. I mean, it's definitely not every every place. And also the other thing, even better than that, I would think is iNaturalist to see like who's, you know, put in elderberry in the Bay Area and see if people are posting and where they're finding them. That would actually be a really good one. Um, I often forget about that, but um, of course it's a great resource. So um, another great immune um, uh, blend to make is what's called fire cider. And um, you could add elderberries to this, um, though it's more of a, a remedy that's spicy and vinegary um, and sometimes has like, sometimes has rosemary. We'll talk about the, the um, traditional recipe. So Rosemary Gladstar started in, um, her herbal career in Sonoma County. Um, she was taught by her grandmother. And um, this probably came from her grandmother, though um, uh, it's it's just really good. It's spicy, it's really hot and warming and, and has honey in it. And it's really great for, it helps with circulation because of the ginger and garlic in there and horseradish, but also I've used it primarily for like, ooh, I do feel like I'm coming down with something. I'm gonna put a little bit in water, drink it down, and it just, you feel great. But you can use it also for um, digestion. 
and helping um, and also for flavoring and you'll see when you see the recipe. Um, what's interesting about this recipe is that it's also had a big legal battle in the last few years. Um, so the whole free the fire cider because it had been fire cider had been tra trademarked by a company and um, Rosemary found out and some other a lot of people were making it just on a small scale and so three herbalists who you know it's not like they were making a ton of money but they're like no this is this should not be trademarked and they actually won the case it took years like four years four or five years and um, it was recognized as a generic term and really because Rosemary's like look I always wanted this to be for everyone it shouldn't be trademarked and it really is a is a could be a landmark case for, for terms that have been used for a while um, that are in the general public and just you know being recognized as that and how it may actually be a precedent for other cases like this. So it was, a, it was great. And um, so, and a lot of people really got into it. Um, so the, the whole idea of fire cider really exploded. But here's the basic recipe. It's um, ginger, horseradish, um, fresh horseradish and when you're when you're grating that just be really mindful if you've never worked with horseradish it is strong um, but that's good right it opens the sinuses it's you know helps with that kind of diaphoretic action of opening the pores when we're not feeling well um, onion lots of garlic cayenne peppers some people put jalapeno peppers it's really what you want you can put really hot peppers you can do less this this is a recipe the basic recipe that you can really play around with to some extent the citrus is really nice in there a lemon or an orange chopped up the whole thing and then um, fresh rosemary and then a newer ingredient is the turmeric which when i first started making this that wasn't part of it but um, again you can play around with it and add and then covering this with apple cider vinegar and um, yeah so basically you put um, all of these in the bottle like this and this looks like it has a little bit of parsley or cilantro in it so you will see some variation and maybe even peppercorn so this slight variation on the formula but that's it you'll see a lot of different recipes so you chop them all up and it's nice to layer them they actually look really beautiful um, when you do that um, and then you cover them with the apple cider vinegar and you can add the honey later um, what's really important is that it's chopped and that when you put the lid on if it's a metal lid that you cover that um, you have a layer of wax paper or parchment paper between the vinegar and your metal lid because vinegar and metal they'll you'll have a really weird reaction and um, it'll it'll actually start corroding the metal and you'll see it so you don't want that and then you want to shake it well and store it and you want to um, you know let it sit for four to six weeks so when i learned about it um one of the things that sometimes we do at the herbal school is um, people actually talk about burying it in the earth and letting it what's called macerating at that point um basically it's soaking and um one of my colleagues years ago because she'd heard that she's like okay let's bury one we'll make the same recipe we'll just split it in half one we're going to bury in the ground and let it be there for a month and the other one we're going to have out and she was like they did actually taste different she felt like you know it i don't know if it was the constant temperature or the energetics you know so if that's interesting to you you can do that or not we actually made sure to have a colored or special red rock that went above where we uh buried it otherwise um you have to be very careful when you're digging them out um some people, you know, when they're making these types of extracts too, you can play around with like starting it on a new moon or a full moon or that type of a thing. Um, just another element to put in there. Um, but the main thing is just having high quality ingredients um, when you're making it. And then, um, and then you strain it and then you add your honey if you want it to have that honey, which I like. It actually cuts the vinegar um flavor but of course vinegar apple cider vinegar is really health giving good for digestion um and everything so fire cider has gotten it got so popular <laughs> that there's now a whole book with over 100 recipes um 
you know, playing around with it. So if you really want to get into this, go for it. Um, so again, it can be taken straight. Some people just use it every day, especially in the winter and when it gets cold again, which it will at some point. I know it's hard to believe now. Um, you can add it to veggie juice. You could add it to a healthy Bloody Mary. It's an interesting idea. Um, using it as a flavoring. So you can see it can be a condiment and moving into uh, medicinal, but it's a really easy thing to do um, and to have on hand with your elderberry um, to stay well during the winter season. Um, I also like this idea of saving the strain. So once you once you're done with it, you know, and you're straining it, you still have what's left over. And um, you could add those, chop those up and add those to stir fries or spring rolls and, and, you know, use them within a few days after straining it out. Or you could even add a little bit to soups and that type of a thing. So, um, yeah, with fire cider, taking a teaspoon a day, you would take it actually like the elder. It'd be the same kinds of dosaging um, for colds and flus. And that is what I have for tonight. So any other questions or comments? So yeah, it didn't take quite an hour and a half, but that's, that's okay. This is what we got. Um, so I'm open to other questions just about other herbs that are around right now or anything else you may, well, we'll keep it herbal. <laughs> I can't help with the other things. <laughs> Was this what folks were looking for? This is my first like anything herbalist and I I kind of got into it over this whole COVID thing being stuck at home, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but I signed up for a bunch of classes at um, California School of Herbal Medicine coming up too. So I might see you in those Zoom meetings. Um, yeah, yeah, there is that uh, like herbal essentials and other classes. Yeah, 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 I'm doing that. And then I'm Great. doing the, I don't know, there's one for teeth and gums and wild yeah. edibles. So I'm super excited. I feel like I've, I'm almost 30 and I've been like trying to find something that I'm excited about learning and I'm excited about this. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. That's fun. Yeah, you'll do fire cider in that essentials class. You might even do cordial too, actually get a whole demo on making it. That'll be great. Yeah. Um, good. Well, wonderful. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Thank you. Yeah. I, I yeah. feel like I learned a lot even tonight and like there's just little things I've been learning. I started making like an immune immunity tea that I saw somewhere and a lot of the things in that tea are in this fire cider too. Like mm -hmm. it's it's just, I mean, it's crazy. All of the stuff that just all this natural, natural things you can find can do for your body and to keep you healthy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I know. And it's a good lifelong study for sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm seeing there's also a test to be sure you're really using elderberries and not other berries that could be poisonous. It's a great question. There's, there's not a test. Um, um it's knowing like going back let's see if i can i can go back to having positive id you know that's really the most important thing and so um like i said that's why i was really pointing out these opposite um what are called pinnately compound leaves where you have the leaflets coming off the sides like this the leaflets themselves are also serrated um and that it's a you know a flat pretty a flat top cluster i can't think of anything else in sonoma county growing in the wild in fact yeah i can't think of anything else that would not be elderberry but you do want to double check for sure um you know it is a, it, it's going to be you know taller than you for sure um yeah, there just isn't anything else here that, um, unless you're in some crazy garden, you know, but then you're in a garden if somebody planted a bunch of different things. But even that, I can't, I, I don't know of anything. Um, but it's always a good question. And so let plantid.net is a really good resource. Um, yeah, and right, make sure to have some pictures or a field guide. And when you're harvesting, if you're like, I'm really not sure, you know, um, just take a little bit take a leaf, take a picture, you know, of a couple things and then go on, you know, you can, you can post a picture to iNaturalist and people will help you identify things as well. Um, but it's a really good point about learning your plants and um, uh, 
how to do that. And so this is one of the easier trees certainly to identify. And again, it often isn't a single trunk, it's often multi-trunked. Um, so it's unusual in that way as well. It's a great question. Okay, any other questions or comments? I don't know what's doing that. Um, yeah, if you haven't used iNaturalist, it's a really cool resource. Um, so that iNaturalist, that's, you can um, like connect with other people who have found things growing wild in your area. I'm on the central coast, so you guys are a little bit more north than me. Yeah, um, yeah, you definitely can. I mean, it's, it's a worldwide, um, uh, people posting everything from bugs that they find to plants and people who are professional like this is what they do for a living to just like I have no idea I'm just trying to figure out what I have here right yeah. and where okay. about the central coast are you um I'm specifically in Morro Bay if you know where that's yeah. at uh -huh. yeah yeah yeah. Um, yeah, so that's what I would do. And then also look at Cal Flora and just get a sense of like, oh, where did, where are things growing? But yeah, iNaturalist is going to definitely be um, the thing to look at to see what people are finding. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Um, okay, any other questions or comments? Oh yeah, by the way, the picture behind me, this is of the California School Garden this spring. So you get a little sense of what it looks like. Um, yeah. Well, great. Um, let's see. I'm not seeing any other questions. Yeah, you're welcome. Let's see if, uh, Holland, you want to, uh, add anything in here? Yeah, uh, sure. Say thank you for coming tonight with everything going on, and thank you, Holland, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Autumn. That was great. And I'm really excited to make some fire cider and let it sit for those four weeks to get me into the late into the fall. Um, and yeah, I just want to also mention, you know, we've got a great lineup of upcoming virtual classes. Um, you can get up to date posts on that if you follow us on social media or on our website. Um, and I'm super excited to be um, hosting with Autumn again next month for a class on wild edibles, uh, focusing on fall, the fall abundance. So things like acorns and bay nuts. Um, so you can register for that one on our website. That'll be September 22nd. And um, coming up very soon here, we have a webinar about invasive plants. Um, that one is on September 3rd. And then we also have one the following week on September 10th with um, Clint McKay, who is our Indigenous Education Coordinator and the Chair of our Native Advisory Council, who will be speaking about Native practices with fire, um, so traditional ecological stewardship using fire. Um, so that should be a really great talk. And then towards the end of the month on the 26th, we have a class on lichens, a lens on lichens with um, Jesse Miller, a lichenologist. So I'm looking forward to that one as well. Um, yeah, and in the meantime, um, we hope you all take care, and this recording will be made available on YouTube, um, so if you want to go back and review anything, you're welcome to do that or share it with friends, um, and then I will email out the PowerPoint to those of you who were on our registration list. So that sums it up. Thanks so much for being here tonight, and thank you, Autumn. That was great. Yeah, you're welcome, and thanks, everybody. Good to see you, and stay well, stay safe.